Shepherds are not very common in today's world. Modern practices have eliminated many needs a shepherd would give. But during the reign of King David, shepherds were very common, which is why in Psalms that David uses them to illustrate some of his poems. Please turn your Bibles to Psalms chapter 23. In this psalm, David uses shepherds and sheep as, a, as an example of their relationship between God and man. But we need to understand a few things about shepherds first. Sheep are in need of food, they're lost, and they're confused on the right way to go. But the shepherd, they guide and they protect the sheep and they give them food and rest. Sheep are lost without a shepherd. They're tired and they're hungry. We are sheep, but we have a shepherd. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. What are the needs in our lives? What things in this world do we think we need more of, no matter how much we have? Money? Status? David says that with the Lord as his shepherd, he shall not be in need of anything else. He says the Lord calms, feeds, and restores his soul. Jesus talks about that we even worry for even the most basic things and that we shouldn't in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 33. He says, therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Jesus is saying if we choose him as our shepherd, all of these worries will fade, and our souls will be restored, fed, and calmed by him along the way. If you continue reading on through Jesus' sermon in Matthew chapter 6 into Matthew chapter 7, you can find some difficult news. Verses 13 through 14 says, Enter, says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. How can we know the right way to go? Let's look back at Psalm 23, verses 3 through 4. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. As a shepherd leads his sheep, and they must follow him to be safe, we must follow God in the paths of righteousness, not for our name to be honored, but for God's name. Then David describes this dark valley where death is near and all around him. This describes the world we live in, a sinful world. Sin is around us, and it tempts us. It could frighten us with its darkness. But God is near, and David knows that with him, there is nothing to fear. In the final section of the psalm, David switches from the image of a shepherd and his sheep to the image of a royal banquet, similar to how David in his own life went from shepherd to king. Let's read verses 5 through 6 of Psalm 23. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Even amongst his enemies, God has given David goodness, mercy, and overflowing blessings throughout his life. How can we get these blessings? Let's look back at Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Here Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who who ask him. We are giving blessings through prayer when we ask God. 
David's final phrase in the psalm is the conclusion of all of his thoughts. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But what does David's life have to do with ours? What does it have to do with the life of a follower of Christ? Turn to John 10, and let's read verses 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. We have the same God today as David had in his day, and he is still our shepherd. He still comforts us, he still guides us, and we know that if we obey Jesus, we can dwell in the Lord's house forever in a place called heaven. Can you please be standing for the song and for the scripture reading to follow? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same. reading tonight comes from Luke chapter 6 verses 20 through 26 and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. 
Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. You may be seated. Good evening. So I got a super awesome story to tell y'all. Now this, this story is completely true. Honest to goodness, 100% true. In fact, it just happened about a year ago, last September. So last September, it's still warm, the weather's still nice, and me and Liberty and some of our friends all decide to go on a backpacking trip, camping trip, in the Rocky Mountains. I mean, the weather was awesome, it couldn't have been any better. The spot we were camping at, it was iconic. It was like a picture-perfect camping site. We started at about 900 elevation. We hiked up to 1,100 elevation, which was an awesome but brutal hike. Um, and we were camping out there in this valley that was surrounded by all these mountains, these huge peaks. If you've ever been to Colorado, if you've ever been to um, Pikes Peak, that's what they call a 14er, which means it's at 14,000 elevation. But what a lot of people don't know is that there's 26 other 14ers in the Rockies in Colorado alone. And in addition to the 14ers, there's 13ers. So I say that to say where we were camping, we were surrounded by these mountains, by these 13,000 foot peaks and these 14,000 foot peaks. So we camp, it goes pretty all right. And the next day, my buddy Sean convinces me, hey, you see this little mountain right here? Let's, let's hike up this mountain. And to us, from where we could see, like from our view, it didn't look like much. It just looked like a little mountain right there. So I was like, all right, whatever. It was not a mountain with a trail. Whenever you climb a steep mountain, there's usually what you call switchback trails that help you go up it gradually so that you're not going too steep. Now, I'm not saying that we were rock climbing up this mountain, but hear me when I say that the path we took, which was no path, it was our own path, was so steep that you basically had to climb on all fours, almost crawl like a bear because if you stood straight up you might fall back like it was that steep so we, we go up to the top to where we could see and it was a false summit which means what we thought was the top was not the top and we we're like oh man all right well we already came up this high we might as well keep going so we keep going to where we can see and then it's another false summit we are still not at the top and this happens four or five times to where we are so high up we are like oh my goodness we've been gone for hours and we are very, very high up. We're a little intimidated. You know, it's very steep down, no path. It's just rocks. We're above tree line at this point. Um, and at this time, we now have service because we're so high up. So for you uh, fellow outdoor nerds, we uh, pulled up our uh, All Trails app, which tells you your elevation based on your location. And so we pulled up that app, and we were like, dude, we are like at 12,900-something elevation. If we go just a little bit more, we will be at 13,000 elevation and we can say that we climbed a 13er all the way up. So we do that. We keep going until we meet 13,000 elevation. And Sean, by this time, I'm winded. I mean, there's no oxygen up there. But Sean is a very conditioned wrestler, my good buddy at Bear Valley. Um, and so he was like, dude, I can actually see the very top. I'm just going to go up there real quick so I can say I went to the very top of the mountain. And I said, hey, be my guest. I've made it to 13,000 feet. I'm going to rest for a second. So I'm sitting there, and I'm resting. Um, Beautiful spot, beautiful view. I actually have a really quick video for you just to give you an idea. Andrew, you're good with that video. From the bottom to the top, straight up. No trails. This is some of the 13,000 feet. Let's go, Sean. There's your go. Okay, so beautiful, right? I mean, it was gorgeous. And sorry about the noise. It was super, super windy. But there was the edge right there. I mean, you could see all of the other mountains. You could see the tree line way beneath you. Um, I'm, I'm winded. We know it's going to be a long hike down. <laughs> and so I decide to rest for a second while Sean's doing his thing. So I'm eating my beef jerky. I'm eating my trail mix. I'm drinking my water. And I just lay back and close my eyes for just, it had to have only been like five minutes. And then I open my eyes and look up to see staring in my face, there is this huge storm front coming in. And when I say staring in my face, I'm serious because when you're that high up, when there's a storm, when there's clouds, you are face to face with it. And you could tell it was coming in fast and it was coming right at us. And I knew that we were in trouble because if you're on the top of a mountain in a storm, if there's lightning, you are the tallest object because there's no trees, there's no big rocks. It's just 
little rocks and cactuses, cacti. But so, we're, so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh no, oh dear goodness, like we have to go. And I'm looking for Sean. I know I can't leave without him. I'm like, we came up here together. We go down together. And finally, he must have seen at the same time I see him start trucking down the mountain and he's hurrying as fast as he can. And we get together and we head down together and we haven't taken like five paces until it hits us. And we get caught in the worst hailstorm I've ever seen in my life. So believe me that this was a very tricky situation because down at the bottom of the mountain, it was really warm and it was still kind of warm up on top. So we only had one layer of clothing on. We had no shelter, no trees, no cave, no rocks, no fire, no coat, nothing. And it's so steep down, you have to go slowly, except now it's slick because of all the hail. The hail is actually hurting really bad, but the worst part was that we immediately got super, super cold. I mean, it came with a cold front. Temperatures dropped immediately. So we're in a really bad situation. We are in a pickle. And honestly, I get that pit in my stomach if anybody has ever thought, this might be it. Like, I might die today. If you've ever been in that situation, you know what I'm talking about. Like that, just, oh, that awful feeling of, oh no, this is not good. And honestly, to this day, I don't know how long the hail lasted. Um, I think like 30 minutes, but we couldn't feel our hands. We couldn't feel anything. We were colder than you can imagine. And actually, I did slip a couple of times, but kind of fell back on my backside. But again, it was so steep that if you fell forward, you would not stop rolling until you got to the bottom. And Thank goodness, after 30 minutes, the storm went away as fast as it came in, and then the sun came out and started warming us up a little bit. We kind of took a deep breath and started going slower down the mountain, but in that moment, things were not good. I was honestly a little terrified. Again, the thought of this could be my last day. The title of my sermon this evening is The Truth About Life. The truth about life. I tell you that story to tell you that, again, if you've ever been in that situation where you realize how futile, how fragile life really is, you start asking yourself a lot of questions about life. Maybe it's a loved one whenever they died. Maybe it's you go through a really hard time, and then maybe you come close to death or the possibility of it. It causes you to ask questions about life. Questions like, why do we live? What is our purpose? Why do we get up? Why do we go to bed? Why do we eat? Why do we sleep? Why do we have fun? Why do we work? What is the purpose of life? What is the truth about life? There are many different truths about life, but this evening, I want to talk to you about one specific truth. The thought that this life is not about this life. This life is not about this life. If you will, let's go back to Luke. Let's observe one more time what our Lord said here in this awesome passage. Luke 6, starting in verse 20. And turning his gaze towards his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who hung, or excuse me, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. But woe to you who are rich. For you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. If you will with me, let's really look into this text. Let's dissect it, tear it apart, look at the parts and examine this and go deeper and figure out some truths. First of all, notice right here how there are two different groups represented, each by three verses with verse 23 kind of as a buffer, kind of as a divider. Also notice that the groups are labeled, they're titled. Jesus says group one are blessed, and he says woe to group two. Also notice how each one has different aspects about them. 
group one and group two. Compare and contrast them. Notice how one is poor, hungry, weeping, hated, and the other is rich, well-fed, happy, and loved. Now, in a logical person's mind, just looking at that from the surface level, they would look at that list and say, well, that one is woe. Woe to the poor, hungry, and weeping, and hated. That's not a good place in life to be. And they would say, the rich, the well-fed, the happy, and the loved, they, they are truly blessed. But Jesus says the opposite. Jesus says, blessed are the poor, hungry, weeping, and hated, and woe to the rich, well-fed, happy, and loved. But why? Why is that the case? Why does Jesus say something that almost doesn't seem logical, that almost seems strange? It's because Jesus knew that this life is not about this life. If you will, look with me at this. In addition to most people not being on the same page as Jesus because they're just thinking about this life, it also seems that Jesus is indicating that one is heaven-bound while the other is risking losing the reward. They're risking not going to heaven. Notice that right here. I hope that's not hard to see. But he's talking about how it's in present or sorry, future tense. All of these things, all of these promises, the fact that they're blessed, it's because of future tense aspects. And be woe to them because of future tense aspects. And then in verse 23, it's pretty clear. He says, great is your reward in heaven. The thought is that Jesus knew that this life is about the next life. Jesus knew that this life is not about this life because it's all about the next life. And again, the logical mind, the person who's maybe thinking more naturally, they only see this life. If they're not eternally minded, their take, their view, their focus, their priorities are going to be different than what Jesus is saying right here. And I want to take three points out of this text. Three points that go a little bit deeper, make a little bit more application to us specifically. First of all, we know that this life is not about being comfortable. This life is not about being comfortable. If you will, look at the beginning of verse 20 and 21 and compare that to verse 24 through 25. He said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. And then on the other hand, but woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you, full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. So is it saying that money and being comforted with material blessings, does that automatically condemn us to hell? No, it does not, not necessarily. But what is your focus? What is your priority? Is your entire life, is your entire focus, is the reason you live for the American dream? How many Christians are living every day, they're focusing the entire life on making sure that they have enough money, that they're well fed, that they have enough money saved up so that one day they can retire and then die in comfort? The American dream, our 21st century mindsets, and I would even say our more Western mindsets, chasing the American dream. Is that the point of life? Is that why we're here? Is that the reason we live? Is that the truth about life? No, this life is not about this life. Consider Jesus' words here in Luke 16, 13. He said, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Does being rich automatically condemn you to hell? No, it does not. Does having comfort in this life make you lost? No, but it sure could. Think about the rich young ruler. When Jesus went to him and said, follow me, he had everything in his life right, except he could not prioritize Jesus over his riches. His riches wound up being number one. He couldn't serve two masters. He did not follow Jesus because of his wealth, because of his physical comfort in this life. 
he failed to realize that this life is not about this life. He thought this life was about being rich. He thought it was about being comfortable. Also, think about later on in the same book when Jesus tells this amazing story of the rich man and Lazarus. If you will, let's read that real quick. Luke 16, 19 through 31. This is a powerful but very convicting story. Luke 16, 19 through 31. It reads, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. And he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony." Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Look again at that previous verse. He said, child, remember that during your life, verse 25, during your life, his life here on earth, during your life, the rich man failed to realize the true purpose, the point, the focus, the priorities that were supposed to be correct in his life. It seems as if he was too focused on being comforted physically, on the comforts that he could obtain through riches, wealth. He failed to realize that this life is not about this life. But what do we do? What do we do about this, church? We chase God instead of money. Again, It's not a bad thing to have money, but where is your priority? What are you putting first? Who is your master? Matthew 6.33, as Matthew read earlier, says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you as well. I know it feels like we have to do it all ourselves, that we have to be self-sustaining like Keith talked about this morning, but we don't. If we put God first, if we keep him priority, if we keep him as master, The money will follow. The provisions will follow. The needs will follow. But be it far from us to allow the comfort and the pleasures of life to be our master, to be first in our life. Be it far from us for the reason for living, the reason for our life to be that we just wanted money, that we wanted to be comforted. What else do we do? We need to renew our minds. Because again, this thought process is because we live in a naturally minded world. We are not of this world, but we do live in this world. And if we're not careful, the same mindsets will become ours. We will adopt the natural way of thinking instead of being spiritually minded. Romans 12.2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Transform your mind. I know it's hard. I've been in the same place just thinking about money. I've been guilty of it too. But we have to renew our focus. We have to renew our priorities. We have to understand that this life is not about this life. That it's not about being comfortable. In summary, it would be better to be poor and hungry and heaven bound than it would to be rich and well fed and hell bound. Because this life is not about this life. Moving on, number two, this life is not about being happy. Woo, that's a big one right there. 
this world, they're living to be happy. I think one of the biggest lies I've ever heard is, God just wants you to be happy. That's not what God says. God just wants you to go to heaven. God just wants your soul to be saved so that you can be one with him. And yes, there will be happiness there, but we are not always promised happiness in this life. But I fear that that's what we get caught up in chasing. I fear that that's why we live our life is to be happy. It's definitely why the world is living. They want to be happy. They want to do things that make them happy. They want to live in the ways that make them happy. But guys, being a Christian sometimes comes with hardship. Being a Christian does not always mean being happy. I don't know about y'all, but I am not happy at the fact that wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are they that are following it. I wish it was the way to life that was wide. It's not reality. I don't know about y'all, but I'm not happy when I think about all the people who have and are dying outside of Christ. I don't know about y'all, but I'm not happy whenever I have to suffer persecution and trials as a Christian, but not return evil for evil because it's my job as a Christian. I don't know about y'all, but when I've realized at different times in my life where I was at as far as sin and how much I had allowed sin to rule and reign in my life, that I wasn't very happy in those moments. In fact, I was very, very sad. I don't know about y'all, but I am not happy when I have to put myself down, when I have to pick up my cross and follow after Christ, when I have to deny myself. That's not easy. That's not always a happy place. But again, the world is saying it's just good to be happy. Just whatever's best for you, whatever floats your boat, as they say. We have to renew our minds. I have a question for you, something that challenges my thinking. The Great Depression, something that many of us were not alive for, and it's actually very, very hard for us to even fathom what it was like. That was not a happy time. It was called the Great Depression for a reason. But think about this. This is all a maybe. I actually have no idea if this is the case or not. But if the church flourished during the Great Depression, which wouldn't surprise me, if the church grew faster and did better in the Great Depression, that was a better scenario than today. Because I fear it is the comfort, the easiness of life, the easiness to obtain happiness, shallow happiness in this world, the distractions that is causing America to fall, that is causing America to dwindle spiritually. You've heard the statistics. You know how more and more disinterested in religion in general that America is becoming. We're becoming more and more agnostic, more and more atheistic. And I think a lot of it points back to, again, the distractions, the pleasures, the happiness that this life and this day and age offer. There's an old saying uh, that I heard at Bear Valley a lot that was pretty powerful. It said, if you don't think the church is growing, it's because you're an American. Let that sink in for a second. Because overseas, when they're not as well off as Americans, when it's not a first world nation, when it's a second and third world country, the church is growing. Souls are being saved. And I honestly think that there's a connection between the focus, the motive, the distractions that are less there about being happy than here. We have to renew our minds. We have to understand that we can't strive in this life just to be happy because this life isn't about this life. Let's look forward to the happiness, to the blessing, to the glory of the next and not worry about how necessarily happy our life is today. Again, look at these scriptures. Blessed are you who weep now for you shall laugh compared to woe to you who laugh now for you shall mourn and weep. Again, this life is not about being happy. In summary, it's better to be sad now and heaven bound than happy and hell bound. This life is not about this life. Moving on to number three. This is another big one. This life is not about being loved. How many knows that this society, that this world, wants nothing more than to be loved and accepted? Now, don't hear me wrong. When I'm saying loved, I'm not talking about being loved by God because I believe we all have 
a natural inclination for the love that God has to offer for us. We're all drawn to that love. But I'm talking about the acceptance. Someone likes me. I want to be loved. Think about our society, this woke culture that we live in that says anything goes. There is no truth. Everybody has their own truth. Everyone should be happy with everyone. Why? Because they just want everyone to feel loved and accepted. I think about those coexist bumper stickers. Man, I hate those. You guys know what I'm talking about? It has a different symbol for every single religion, and it's talking about coexisting and just being okay with each other. Why? Because this world, the natural mindset, just wants everybody to be loved, everybody to be happy. But Jesus' mindset was different. He said, blessed are you when people ostracize you. That Greek word right there for ostracize, it's pretty insane. It means to separate, set apart, or mark off. So while the world's focus is being loved and accepted, Jesus said it's better for us to be hated and rejected if it means going to heaven. There's an old saying about Paul that says in Acts, it seems like he either started a revival wherever he went, or he started a riot. He was so bold about his faith. He was so bold about his convictions. He was a man that stuck to his guns and didn't back down. He either started a riot or he started a revival. Not that we should start any riots, but if there's nobody in your life who has an issue with you, if there's no one in your life who does not like you because of what you stand for, you might not be standing tall enough. You might not be talking loud enough because there should be somebody in your life who is not about what you stand for. Because Jesus said it's blessed, it's better to be hated and rejected by man for my sake. Again, not that you go stirring up trouble. It's for the sake of the Son of Man, for the sake of Jesus, because of our faith. I want to illustrate this with something. People want to be loved. People want to be liked. So many people, they live through this right here. You hear that? You laugh, but that's what a lot of people live for right there. How many likes can I get? How appreciated am I in the eyes of the world? How accepted am I? How loved am I? But the challenging thought, what we have to renew our minds to, is that this life is not about that. It doesn't matter how much we're liked here in this life. It doesn't matter how much people are about us or about what we stand for, about what we do. This life is not about being loved. In summary, it is better to be hated and rejected by others while heaven bound than be loved and accepted by others while hell bound. This life is not about this life. This reminds me of the words that Jesus speaks later into this book. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost. He's talking in a spiritual sense. What does it profit you? Because the likely statistical aspect is that you will not gain the whole world, even if you strive for it your entire life. You will probably never, ever be at the place where you are as comfortable financially as you want to be. You'll probably never, ever be at the place where you are as happy as you want to be. And you will never be at the place where you are loved by as many people as you want to be loved and accepted by even if that's what you strive for and live for. But even if you did attain it, even if you did attain all three, even if you did attain the entire world, Jesus said it doesn't matter. What gain is it if you yourself are lost, if you yourself are destroyed? There is no gain. So My challenge for you this week is to ask yourself, why have I been living? What has been the purpose of my life? What has been the focus of my life why do I get up? Why do I go to bed? Why do I eat? Why do I sleep? Why do I have fun? Why do I work? What is your motivation? What is the point? What is the reason of your life? This life is not about being comfortable. This life is not about being happy. And this life is not about being loved. We all must challenge ourselves to think differently, to renew our minds, to strive for the next life, to keep it in mind. 
because this life is truly about the next life. If you're here tonight and you know you haven't been living for the right reasons, you know your mindset hasn't been right, you know your purpose hasn't been right, then we can help you with that. There's still time. That rich man with Lazarus, he waited till it was too late. But there's still time for us to repent. There's still time for us to get our priorities straight, to live for the right reason. But if you're here tonight and you just really want prayers for this and you need support and help to correct your life, then you can come down to the front as we stand and as we sing.